Oh, hello. You were, uh, you were probably here about the, uh, the story. Elves love to tell stories. I bet you didn't know that about elves. There's a, probably a lot of things you, you didn't know about elves. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we're rolling out the red carpet today for you. Today, we'll answer your questions, including how to know if you're on track to meet your goals, whether it makes sense to pay a tax penalty to convert an IRA to a Roth, what returns we should expect from the stock market, and more. Plus, in our headline segment, we'll tackle how the pros handle nasty markets. We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline and offer up a slice of my trivia. And now two guys who have the sleds out to slide this week down to Friday. Here come Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I used to love sledding, but I haven't been on a sled in forever. Spring break this year, the OG family is headed to the mountains to get our full dose of winter weather. Oh, I see. You just go for a week and get it when you want it and then go back to, uh, you know, kind of... exactly uh, how I run my life. I get everything I want when I want it. Yeah. No, that's not true. This took many, many days of staying in Marriott's to earn enough points. (laughs) Turns out it's a peak season... I thought you were going to uh, say, allegedly, it takes many, many days of staying married to get what you want one time. <laughs> well, there's that. Right. Welcome to the Success in Marriage Sometimes podcast. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the podcast desk from me, a.k.a. the rickety table. You think someday we're ever going to replace the table? I thought we were going to replace that with the big fancy move of the basement. Well, we right. are. That money in the budget. But well, not for a new table can't get a new no. basement and a new, mom's getting mom is paying for the move mm-hmm. and the table is our one thing we own besides these microphones but so glad well, that every, and that and our intellect <laughs> yes we're gonna try to use our intellect today because we got listener questions always some of our favorite episodes when we do these so we're gonna try to knock down as many of those as possible but first we've got a headline before we get to the headline, just got to say thanks to everybody who used our link when they went to stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money. By the way, I love it when people write to me and tell me, hey, you know what? I went to magnify money or I found this thing at magnify money. And I'll tell you, by the way, the converse of that. And I should focus on the positive, but let's focus on the negative for a second. Whenever you see those dumb online posts, people going, hey, what's the best uh, online checking account? And somebody goes, oh, I like this one. Oh, I like this one. And I'm like, hmm, I know a place that has all of those and probably four that are better than any of the ones that are mentioned. But because I'm a nice guy, I don't actually write that. I just go, "Mm, people listen to the show. They know about Magnify Money, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. And they don't. You're so passive aggressive. It's fantastic. They don't. It's like when I want to correct people's grammar on Twitter. (laughs) Oh, and blog man. post headings, headlines. And you're like, I really feel like you should know that. Yes. It's apostrophe. Yes. Not plural. But OK, it's possessive, not plural. Mm, there's a difference. No, you do. We just get to have our righteous superiority moment for ourselves. Oh, we so to- <laughs> totally do. It's like that uh, that coffee mug that says I'm silently correcting your grammar. <laughs> Every moment. T-shirt. Yeah, I bet people have done that to us. So instead of uh, looking like the snootiest guys on the internet, let's just get to our headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Only one headline today so we can get to more of your letters. You're welcome. But I want to talk about this with all of the gyrations in the stock market. You know, at one point, the stock market, a.k.a. the Dow Jones Industrial Average, was close to 26,000. And then last week, it plunged to nearly 25,000, and people were getting a little jittery, OG, when I saw this piece from Newsmax, and this is written by- You're not actually quoting an article from Newsmax, are you? This is is, uh, written by Paul Jacobs. I just found this an interesting counterpiece. Plunging markets create opportunity for calm, savvy investors. 
Like every other piece I read on the internet, like, you know, so I use just to tell you the method by my madness, I use Flipboard and I flip through these articles and it's, oh my God, the world's ending. Holy crap. Why is the world ending? What's an inverted yield curve that's making the, the world end? This stuff with China's making the world end, all this stuff. And then plunging markets create opportunity for calm, savvy investors. I'm like, oh my God, there's my piece. There it is. Let's read. Okay. Investors can get queasy when the stock market plunges, but there's a bright side. During a downturn, stocks are on sale. The recent drop and inevitable future plunges can provide opportunities that investors have not seen for quite some time. The key is to keep calm during downturns and stick to your long-term investment plan. It's important to keep your head during big rallies, too. As of early December, the S&P 500 had fallen about 8% from its all-time high in September. After years of sunny skies, the autumn downturn has created the same stomach-dropping sensation as rain clouds appearing in the middle of a picnic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Boy, the hyperbole on this is grotesque. <laughs> so keep reading, and then I'm going to give you the real data. The market rallied in November and early December only to plummet again. Investors are now scrambling to answer key Score questions. Plunge. What caused the drop? Will the downturn continue? What should I do now? When the stock market declines, investors can usually identify one or two obvious culprits. This time, however, it's not so simple. Initially, some observers blamed a rise in interest rates. Some investors fear that rates are rising too fast, making debt more expensive for businesses and consumers alike. In addition, in December, a portion of the yield curve became inverted. This happens when longer-term interest rates are lower than short-term rates. An inversion has preceded several economic recessions. Actually, on our Money in the Morning podcast, I went over that uh, every single one since 1956 has had an inverted yield curve. So, bam, every recession. And, and, and by the way, no false positives on that either. It's always happened. There are many other factors. Look that, at you calling the market. I how like about it. that? When was the top? September 30th? Damn, we missed it. No, but you know what's funny? It actually said that, yes, it's called it. There's never been a false positive. It's always preceded a recession. But in one case, it was three years later. <laughs> so, okay. You know, so it could It'd be funny if it said, yeah, in one case, there's never been a false positive. In one case, it was 15 years after, but it called it. Anyway, several other factors could have called the cause of reversal, and it goes over 57 other reasons why. But then it says when stocks are cheaper, it's a great time to add to underweight positions. For example, you could be underweighted in small U.S. stocks or foreign stocks because they went down more. Especially if you have a long time horizon, a downturn can ultimately help your portfolio overall as long as you don't panic and lock in your losses by selling when markets are down. Downturn will also be a smart time to consider tax loss selling. If you hold securities that have lost value in a taxable account, selling to realize capital losses and investing the proceedings or the proceeds in similar securities can reduce your tax bill. Thought those are interesting things from Paul Jacobs, certified financial planner. Good stuff, OG. I'm just not a big fan of the use of language there. Plunging, soaring. Listen, you have to. You have to, when you're in that business, use strong words as clickbait. But I like the, to use my $100 word, juxtaposition between the clickbaity words and the sound financial advice of understand the data, keep your long-term approach, and there's no reason to panic. My favorite tweet was last week from uh, Ben Carlson, works with the uh, Ritholtz Group in New York. He wrote, the S&P 500 has crashed a whopping plus 2.8% in 2018. <laughs> That's pretty good. It has crashed a whopping plus 3%. I'm reading tweets about people meeting with their financial advisors and finding out that their funds are down because they do the right thing and they don't look at them except when they go to their meeting with their advisor. I'm also reading people online. This this is another uh, poke my eye out thing going. My 401k is sucking. What should I do? And by sucking, move it all to cash. By sucking, they mean since September it's been sucking. But you need to set yourself benchmarks, and then I think from there look at where's the problem, right? Like if the car has a rattle in the engine figure out where the problem is with a rattle. Don't just pull the car over, take off the plates and go buy a different one. Or just ignore the rattle. I can't use your analogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what I would do. But uh, the funny thing is, is that we haven't even 
gotten close to the average decline in a year yet. Down about 10, peak to bottom, twice in 2018 so far. The average is minus 14. So we're not even to the average number yet. And people are freaking out. Oh my gosh, we're down, we peak, peak to trough. We're down eight percent for crying out loud. All that money's evaporated. I mean, you see all this stuff of pe- you know, it's like seven trillion dollars of investment money vanished overnight last night in the overseas trading market. You're like, it didn't vanish. Just, I don't know. I think Just, part of the is issue it, is too, though, is that uh, a lot of the people writing these articles are in their early thirties. And so you look at the time frame of when the last downturn hit and, hey, they understand how to write clickbaity stuff. And they've also never been through one of these before. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Was it Eisenhower or somebody said your plans are worthless as soon as the bullets start flying? You know, your battle plans are worthless. So I find it really interesting, especially in aggregate and some, you know, someday the, we'll have a market recession. Of course, it happens, you know, probably overdue one. But uh I find it really interesting, or I will find it really interesting, I should say, to look at the aggregate investor inflows and outflows. And you can see that on a week-by-week basis. It's going to be horrible. Well, you know, everybody says, hey, I'm going to do this. Okay, we'll see. You know, and to take your Eisenhower point about the bullets, the thing that is even more frustrating is waiting for the bullets to fly and then saying, what do I do now? Yeah. Or thinking, hey, I think the bullets might fly sometime soon, so I'm going to do this. And then, you know, who who was it that uh, Peter, uh, what's his name? Peter Lynch. Lynch. More money was lost anticipating the next bear market than actually in the bear market. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think right. uh, I think we might have more of these conversations in the coming years, Joe. I have a feeling they're all coming. You know, what's funny, though, is that... uh, Because of your inverted yield curve projection. We've had over four years of people predicting the coming downturn. And we now have some data saying that it is uh, three years away or closer if it's like every other historical inverted yield curve that we've ever had. Um, Please, Scott. (laughs) but, but, But still, the number of people calling... I love your quote the best. Uh, Thank you. And maybe that's the title of this episode. The market has crashed a whopping plus two and a half percent this year. (laughs) Time to open up the mailbag. Been getting a little heavy. First one comes to us here from uh, Tyler. Tyler says, I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And it's hard to tell if I'm on track with my savings considering the cost of living here is much less than in other areas. Is there a site or any advice on how to tell if you're on track if you live in a state with very low cost of living? I'm single 29 and I'm a CPA. I own a small rental, $69,000 house, $45,000 mortgage in my home was $117,000. I've got about $80,000 left, bought it a little over a year ago. I make in the $60,000 range and have a net worth including my car excluding, excuse me, my car of 90,000 bucks. Thanks for the help. Uh, thanks for the question, Tyler. Is there a way to know whether he's on track or not? I suppose it all depends on what you're planning on doing. It's very astute. And of course, a CPA would figure this out to think about your retirement goals in the context of where you might use the money. So if you are not planning on living in Sioux Falls, in your financial independence time, you can just go online. One website that comes to mind is City Data. I don't know if it's city data.com or city data.com or something like that, but there's any number of places if you throw into the old Googler, you know, cost of living adjustments between, and you can put in your city and, you know, Melbourne, Australia, or whatever the case may be. City data. Just looked it up on this amazing machine I have sitting here next to me while you were talking. Cool. So, anyways, you know, if you think that you're going to retire to Venice Beach, I would probably make sure that you account for the cost of living differences. And let's say that it costs 30% more to live in Venice Beach than it does in Sioux Falls, then I would make sure that your cash flow is adjusted for that in terms of the original, you know, the top line calculation and then work backward of trying to solve for how much cash flow in Venice Beach do you need? There are no shortage of sites that will help you calculate 
how to get where you want to go. Some of the most simple ones are on all the investment management websites. A guy who did a pretty thorough review of them a couple of years ago, our friend Daryl Kirkpatrick at Can I Retire Yet has done a lot of in-depth work looking at different calculators, both ones that you pay for and ones that you don't. And so if you want to go do that legwork, uh, I'd recommend visiting his site. I think it also works the other way too. What, you know, what happens if you live in a really high cost area and you are planning on retiring to a lower cost area? You live in New York City, but your plan is to retire to Maine. Well, that's a lot of well, those that's all of those uh, segments that we've done about retiring overseas, right? To sure. hack. But what I'm saying is that it would be important also to consider the cost of living differences, whereas you don't have to save as much money going that direction. So astute observation. Thanks for the note, Tyler. Our next letter comes to us from Jeremy. Jeremy says, my wife and I each have a, a rollover IRA from previous employers. We're 43 years old. We're currently contributing to 401k and 401k Roth plans. Is it worth paying the tax penalty now on converting one of our rollover IRAs to a Roth? The 71,000 conversion would likely be all in the 24% bracket, or should we keep it as is and maybe look at later in life conversions? Do we have to convert the full amount? I just don't know the answers, and I hear you don't either, but it was worth the shot. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. What do you think about converting that money? When it comes to conversions, you have to kind of think about the unknown. Right now, we have relatively low federal income taxes. And there's some states, of course, that have no state income taxes. So that should factor into your consideration. The difference between the tax bill today and the potential for the tax bill in the future. The other thing that really matters, I think, in conversions is whether or not you can afford to pay the tax bill in cash as opposed to paying it from the proceeds of the conversion. That really almost never works in your favor in the long run arbitrarily, I picked that 22% threshold, but 24 is pretty good too. Think of it this way. A year ago, that 24 person was in 28. So, you know, they're already discounted 4%. Then you can consider it, especially if you forecast that your income and assets are going to continue to grow into the future. I've never been one to assume that you're going to have a lower standard of living in retirement than you do before retirement, well, why would you retire to like do less stuff and spend less money? That doesn't seem very fun to me. So the idea of, well, I'll just wait until I'm retired and then I'll be in a lower tax bracket may be the case, you know, depending on your circumstances. But I, I don't know that I like to plan on that unless it's like next year, I'm only going to work two months out of the year and I have enough money to, you know, fund the rest of the year out of my, you know, savings account. So I'm only going to be in the 10% bracket or whatever, you know, then you can kind of plan for that. But this 20 year goal thing is hard to think of. And then his last question was, do you have to do it all? No. So maybe the right answer is to do a little bit every year as your cash flow allows you to be able to pay the tax bill. That's what I was wondering you know, is how much, your regular, uh, how much cash Jeremy has regular on hand. cash flow. Yeah. How much cash Jeremy has on hand, I think is a big piece of this OG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If he does have enough cash on hand to handle it all at the 24% tax bracket and he doesn't see his income changing, do you just do it all right now? It's going to be a really unique person by person decision there. And I wish that I had like kind of a broad brush to, to paint with that. I like to just make things be done. So I would probably do it. Yeah. But also, you know, those protections that we used to have of recharacterizations and stuff like that aren't around anymore. So from a safety and security standpoint, in terms of market fluctuation, maybe you space it out over a little while, a couple, yeah. three years. Yeah. A good question. Thanks for the question, Jeremy. Leo is up next. Leo says, I hear the S&P 500 growth at an annual 7 to 10% uh, rate frequently on your podcast. Where does that percentage come from? Why does Google say 10% growth since 1928 and not before 1928? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Leo. You don't just hear it here. You hear it all over the place. He's correct that uh, if you look backwards to 1928, you're looking at roughly a 10% growth rate. The before 1928, I'll peel off that part question of the question, OG, before I throw it over to you for the second part about why 7 to 10%. But before 1928, the stock market was a lot different. After the stock market crash in 1929, there were a lot of stock market reforms put in place to protect investors. And because of that, it was a whole different world. So any comparisons you make pre-1928 really aren't as valid as anything post-1928-29. That's that part of the historical part of the question, unless you want to add to that. What do you think about why do we use 7 to 10 all the time? 
Well, the seven to 10 number comes, obviously the 90 year number is 10.02 or something like that. But the time frame really matters. If you're going to have a time frame of your goal of 10 or 20 years, you know, there's certainly 10 and 20 year periods where the S&P has only averaged 8% or 7% or 9 or something like that. And there's also been 10 and 20 year periods where the S&P has averaged 14 and 15. The way that I like to say it is we have high expectations for our investments, meaning we expect them to behave a certain way, but we're going to plan for them to behave a little bit less than our high expectations. So you kind of have to do two comparisons on an annual basis. This is what we do, which is, did our money behave the way we expect it to from an investment standpoint? Yes or no. And then also, did we achieve our financial planning goals based on a lower planning assumption? Yes or no. And those two things you know, have different different answers and different outcomes based on those answers. And, and that specifically is why I like using as low a number of my planning as possible. Because if I can make it work at 7% or at 6% or at 5% and I invest like it's going to do 10 yeah, and it continues to do 10, how kick-ass is that that I get to decide later on what method of flexibility I prefer? Would I rather you know, get my fire on earlier? Would I rather spend a little bit more money this year? Maybe take a couple mm-hmm. more vacations than I thought? Would I rather upgrade my goals now or later? I mean, it's so much fun stuff happens. Yeah. Pull a little money off the table because you've got enough growth. There's a lot of, a lot of flexibility that you get, which is why I think those two numbers are separate. I think you build your investment plan based on your tolerance for the ups and downs. You know, where is your behavioral freak out point. And <laughs> we talk about it where like, where are you going to say, I don't care what you're telling me about long term. I am taking my money out. And where that threshold is, we want to build an allocation that is not likely to breach that threshold. <laughs> yeah. Because if we can keep you in, in, in the game, we know that statistically you've got a much better shot of reaching it. Right. So there's that. And then the other side of it is the plan. Your investment portfolio, we may have expectations of 10% a year. And so that's going to be our comparison to, you know, how our allocation is and that sort of thing. But in the plan, we might plan on seven. Yeah. Just because, because if we're wrong at 10 and you only get seven, you still get to retire. <laughs> right. the, you know, it's about, it's about managing expectations and that's that a, sort of thing. That's also the reason I agree with Jane Bryant Quinn, that it's the difficult, most difficult thing on earth for a congressperson to stand up and say, Hey, I vote we get rid of the biggest social program in America, AKA social security. Uh, so she says it's going to be around. I tend to agree with that, but I also, if you can don't put social security in your plan, if you can get away yeah. with not putting any social security in your plan. And now you've got that as well. That could be a nice little extra. Well, so interestingly, on. where would you cut that off at? At what age do you say, don't count on, so, you know, plan on not counting on it because you know, somebody who's 64 in their plan. Yeah, good point. I, I think it's pretty safe to say that they're going to get Social Security in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, do you have kind of in your mind, like anybody above this age? Yeah, just keep it in the plan. Anybody below this age, don't type of thing. I've never had it in mind, but I think that probably the spot where I'm at right now is pretty reliably. I would think if you're 50 or above, you could probably mm-hmm. say, OK, yeah. And if you can, you know, if you can uh, 40s, I think is kind of your gray area. But if you're under 40 and you can cut social security completely from your plan, that would be uh, be a great thing to do. Well, it seems to me that on the social security front, I, I agree that it's very difficult to get rid of an entitlement program because even, even the most well thought out plan will be met with opposition from the other side, whatever side that is, and it will be grotesquely overblown the impact, right? It, you get the vision of grandma getting pushed off the cliff you know, in the wheelchair, no matter which person, even if it was the perfect plan, freaking, you know, Alan Greenspan could come out with a perfect social security plan. Mother and, Teresa. And, yeah, exactly. There you go. The Pope <laughs> could say, I've got the problem. I've got, I know how to fix it. And, and one side or the other, you know, would, would lambast them. But, but I happen to think that it's a really good payoff, like social security. Like I, you know, you do the math and you say, well, I'm, you know, I could do better in the market. I got that part too. Yeah, I know you can do better on your own behaviorally wise, by the way, probably not. So the fact that somebody's hanging on to 7% or 6% of your money and going to give it back to you with interest later is a good thing. But I think the biggest thing that will happen from Social Security, my guess is, is that they just have to change the retirement age. You know, my demographics 
uh, were already at age 67 for full retirement benefits, it would not surprise me if they just kind of draw a line in the sand and say, everybody under 40, your new full retirement age is 70. But to, to assume that it completely goes away, I don't know. Probably That's not. It's a little hard pill to swallow. Thanks for the question, Leo. Hey, you know what? It's time for us, I think, to uh, refill our coffee. And uh, let's uh, get Doug out here to do some trivia. What do you think? Please. He's not doing anything anyway. Just eggnogging it. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And here's some cool trivia for all you travelers out there. The first motel, the Milestone Motel, was started back in 1925 on today's date in San Luis Obispo, California, because it was roughly halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, and travelers at that time needed two days to get there. Man, how things have changed. Today I can fly to any sizzler in the lower 48 in about six and a half hours or less. How do you think people did it in those days? Not getting the sirloin combo with mushrooms and a side of three grilled shrimp all for one low, low price? Oh my goodness! How conditions have changed. Here's what else has changed. The speed at which you can get top-notch trivia. Let's deal you up some right now. Let's skip from motels to full-on hotels. What's the largest hotel chain in the world? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. So happy Stacky Benjamins is brought to you by Magnify Money. You know, if you're somebody who's wondering, hmm, do I have the right interest rate on my checking account? Do I have the best one? You know where you find more financial products in one place than any place else on the internet, OG? That would be Magnify Money. And if you use our link, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money, you also tell them that we sent you, as mom says. You always want to be very polite and say, hey, Joe and OG sent us. But taking a look at the magnify money site i'm going to pull that thing up right now because one thing we don't talk about often is their award-winning blog at magnify money and if we click on the blog let's see what they're talking about over there sally may loan consolidation is over but here are some options it talks about two alternatives to sally may loan consolidation if you're looking at loan consolidation of course They have all kinds of different ones. And then should you pay off your credit card debt with a personal loan? What you need to consider? Of course, there's a lot to consider there. That piece written by Laura Woods. They go through five pros and five cons of being able to do that. And then, of course, they take a look at other options like using a home equity line of credit, pros and cons of that, borrowing from a friend or a family member, balance transfer credit cards that can be dangerous, but if you're the right person, could work in your favor. Very thorough stuff at uh, the Magnify Money blog. So whether you're somebody looking for the best credit card, credit miss, reducing your debt, dealing with collections, looking for the worst banks, whatever it might be, that's all on the Magnify Money blog. And of course, you find all kinds of financial products used every day at Magnify Money. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, back with our amazing trivia segment. We're celebrating the holiday travel season by talking hotels today. What's the biggest hotelier in the world? If you said Marriott, that's number three. And IHG, including the Holiday Inn, made so famous in that old movie, well, that's number four. Choice hotels, you know, days in, sleep in, etc., they're number two. But the biggest, well, that's Wyndham weighing in currently at just under 8,100 properties. And the good news, if we don't have room for you here in the basement of Texarkana, we even have a Wyndham right here in town. And if you don't like it, you can go sleep in the other hotel. See ya! The other hotel. Actually, being a border town, we do have mm-hmm. lots of hotels, Doug, but he never notices. You're not really a border town. We are okay. a border town. Okay. They've been talking about that wall that uh, they've been wanting to build the wall between Which side between our Ar- between <laughs> Arkansas and Texas. They're both like, yes, let's build it. <laughs> you bring the bricks, and I'll bring the right. uh, mortar. 
<laughs> is that the argument? The argument is who's who's bringing the brick and who's bringing the mortar. It's not whether or not Texas or Arkansas needs a wall. They'll have barbecue, right? Exactly. Yeah, share the barbecue, but then yell at each other across the wall. And then the the presidents can the president. <laughs> the, then the two the two governors can say, you know, Mister Abbott, tear down this wall. <laughs> Uh, and let's, let's get to the elephant in the room. How the hell did he pronounce San Luis Obispo? I don't know. I think he thinks it's in the middle of the country. <laughs> I think he's mad. It's clearly Spanish, Doug. It's- Please do not write in about Doug's pronunciation of San Luis Obispo. San Luis? Is that Hello. what he said? Well, no, that's, that's the way it is pronounced. San, San Luis. Luis Obispo. It's Obispo. Like, it's uh, Obispo. <laughs> that's it's actually uh, way better than mine. Hey, uh, while we're taking a break from our letters, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline. We're going to tackle one of life's most important questions. Our friends at the Haven Life Insurance Agency. You know what they do, OG? They put what you value first. I'm at a loss. I have no values today. Sorry. I don't value anything. I value moving on with the rest of my day. I'm fully engaged right now, but I'm using all my energy to be seated <laughs> with you right now. So I cannot focus on anything different. How about stock market downturns and an inheritance and cash all at the same time? Sure. Wouldn't you value both yeah. of those? I would. I would. That would be fantastic. It's either that or your loved ones, you know, that die and leave you lots of money and your time. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance. And hopefully they had a big fat insurance policy on them too. Simple. Their application is online. You get an instant coverage decision. In most cases, their prices are affordable. All policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160-year-old insurer. I almost said 60-year-old insurer. An almost six-year-old insurer. Probably don't want that one. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Go ahead and do it. You've got a pause button. You can get that done ASAP and then get back to your listening afterwards. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And today's question comes to us from Ramon. Say hi, Ramon. Hey, Joe and OJJJG. I have a question regarding best practices uh, for budgeting for joint couples. I've run the numbers a few different ways, but I get snagged up when I think about the things that are deducted directly from our paychecks. Um, so obviously, if my wife makes 100000 and I make 50000 for example, you know, I will pay 33% of what our budget says. However, when it comes to things that come directly out of our pay, such as dependent care or health care, I get a little chipped up whether, you know, I add it directly to our monthly expenses and then subtract them from there or I subtract them from the overall salary and get the pro rata numbers from there. So I'm struggling to get the, you know, the most fair way to calculate these numbers and I appreciate your help. Thank you so much for taking my call. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Ramon. Ramon's doing some serious, serious budgeting. Getting in the weeds. Little nickel and diamond. But hey, you got to do that, baby. It's all right. I think it's fun. Yeah. Well, you know, you're a nerd. So one of us would. <laughs> yep. So how would I do this? I would put everything on a spreadsheet and then just spend it out just like you're talking about another way to do it kind of visually use some monopoly money because you can kind of see like the pot of money, so to speak. So deal out a hundred thousand and 50,000. You know what I mean? No, you're looking at me like I'm on drugs. No, I actually, yes, correct. Uh, but that, <laughs> but that's, there's no difference there than last year, the year before that's the same look, but I was actually thinking and wondering if I've heard you say this before or somebody else before just recently, about just the power of visualization. Of course, we had somebody on the show, maybe it was from Money Lion, where they made a visualization about like your stacks of cash and it's spending down, yeah. just an yeah. app, so that you can see it visually and it's easier to yeah. see that way. Yeah, well, I think that'll help clear it up, but easy enough, just throw that in a spreadsheet, you know, 100,000 in one column, 50,000 in the other. You can write down, you know, here are the expenses that are coming out of the $100,000 account, and here's the expenses that are coming out of the $50,000 account. Well, if somebody has the dependent care reimbursement account, that's 50, or I'm sorry, that's five grand coming out of the $100,000 account. Well, guess what? The $50,000 guy, he owes some money on that. So he might pay the electric bill, because that's the budget item, rather than trying to split it up exactly 
you know, where's your two thirds of the electric bill? I'm trying to pay it. Just say, well, you're paying that. I'm going to pay this because from a budgetary standpoint, they're the same numbers. Some apps out there could help you with this. Uh, one popular one that we talked to on the show is the HoneyFi app. We also talked to Aditi from Zeta. So the Zeta app and the HoneyFi app are two that are specifically uh, a budgeting tool for married couples. Here's a, what, what do you think about this, OG? I like it if I use net numbers. So I start with my take-home pay, and I budget that out completely. And then what I do is with the stuff that's withheld from my paycheck, whenever open enrollment comes around, I use that as an opportunity to make sure that those are specifically what should be held from my paycheck. So I make sure that I'm taking full advantage of those, but I'm doing that a little bit separately, budgeting that piece differently. And then around tax time, of course, if I'm getting a big tax refund and I don't want one, or if for some reason I do want a big tax refund, I tweak that around tax time once a year. So besides those two times a year, I just look at things, my take home number, and it gets rid of a lot of Ramon's issues. Well, and and I mean, if you're looking for simplicity, which I didn't hear that in his call, if you're looking for simplicity, why not just have a joint account where all the family budget stuff comes? Like we've got to pay groceries, the electric bill, the water bill, the car payment, the mortgage, and you put two thirds of your money in there and I put a third of my money in there and that's how we budget it. And the rest of it, you know, is for our spending or the rest of it's for our savings or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of different ways to do this, but kudos for getting down to the nitty gritty. I like it. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Ramon. You got a question for the show. You know, there's a lot of different ways to get a hold of us. Obviously, a lot of people wrote us letters in today's show. Only one of them's taken home the greatest money show on earth t-shirt. And that would be. Ramon, because he called the Haven Lifeline, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail to get the Haven Lifeline. Let's jump back into our letters with a few more. Next up, uh, this piece comes to us from Sam. Sam says, you recently answered a question from a listener about paying off a mortgage. You mentioned that some people might use their brokerage account to cash flow their mortgage payment. The example you provided is if you've got 100000 in a brokerage account and a $200,000 mortgage, you could use your brokerage account to cash flow and pay the mortgage. Can you explain this in more detail? I don't remember using those exact numbers because I'm not sure how that math works out, Sam, if that's your your question. I think I said if you've got $200,000 in one and $200,000 in the other. Well, there probably is a break even at some point because sure. ostensibly the, the, the payment is going to be less than you know, what the account should grow at. But that's really the issue. Should you, A, aggressively pay down? Let's let's assume that the threshold is 150 grand. Should I pay $200,000 off on my mortgage, like save up 200 grand, pay it off? Or should I save up 150 grand and say, I've got a diversified portfolio that should generate X percent of return, now, instead of me cash flowing my payment, I'm going to take this 150 grand and have that make and, the payment. And I'm just going to have it set to auto auto pay the mortgage. Yeah. And and the math should work out that it pays itself over the next 23 years, and you know, boom, done. But either way, I'm done paying for it. Therein lies the question. Yeah, those are the different options, and I think that that was our that was our point was you could take two hundred thousand dollars and pay it off right now, or you could let the interest on that account pay it off. And maybe you end up with some money left over at the end. Yeah. Yeah, you could. This is going to be a really personal decision. I know in our family, we go back and forth on it uh, because obviously the math side says, take your mortgage at 3.9% and pay that baby over the longest time possible. Right. But I've also never met anybody in 20 years of doing this that said, you know, I really wish I would have taken a lot longer to pay my mortgage off. Yeah. You know, that was a really cool experience. I'm glad I paid three times the value of my house in interest to my bank. And that piece gets back to good about myself. That piece gets back to the behavioral aspect. I think it makes you more confident and you live a lot easier when you know you don't have the debt burden behind you. Yeah. Well, it gives you some flexibility. There's a lot of pros and cons to both sides of it. So, uh, Know thyself. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Sam. Next up is Will. Will says, uh, recently you all said there were several things you would have done different at age 22. Well, someone who is 22 and fresh out of college, 
Would you care to pay it forward and enlighten me on the advice you give to your younger self? Thank you. Recently discovered your show and loving it. Thanks, Will. What advice would you give yourself, OG, as a 22-year-old? Oh, I can't even imagine. I think some just kind of touchy-feely stuff of like, it doesn't all have to get done right now. You know, just it seems like as you're in the moment that there's so much stuff that needs to get done. You've got to start a family. You've got to get a house. You've got to get a new car. You've got to pay off your debt. You've got, you know, you've got to do all of these things and they all need to get done immediately because it seems like, you know, time is just flying by. If it takes you three years to pay off your student loans, is that worse than having two years to pay them off? Yes. But it's way better than 32 years. And so nothing is so important that it must absolutely positively get done right away. The one thing that I wish I would have done when I was 22 is I wish I would have right-sized my lifestyle from the very beginning. You know, I started working in financial planning at 21 and a half. For those who don't know, 20 years ago, the vast majority of financial planning work was done through product sales. You know, you'd sell a financial plan, so to speak. The result of the plan was really where you made most of your money. And that turned into some pretty volatile income for the first, you know, half decade or so of my career. And so it was, it was always feast or famine. And I wish that I would have, no matter what, said, doesn't matter what the bills are today. It doesn't matter what I'm owed. <laughs> I haven't been paid in three months. So now I'm owed a dinner out type of deal. I wish that I would have said, no matter what, 20% or pick a number is automatically going to go into an account that I'm not going to touch for the rest of my life. So if you have the opportunity to go into a steady income right out of college or right out of, you know, whatever military or something like that, if you're going from a, from a really low base, as in you're a student and you make 10 bucks an hour, now you make $62,000 being an engineer the difference is not noticeable to you if instead you base your lifestyle on making 48000 Because either way, you have this huge increase. So if you start there and then you build your lifestyle from there, you always have that buffer of a, a really, really, really large percentage of your income that's going to savings. And that is how people are doing some of the crazy stuff that you read about. Like, how did I save $2 million in 15 years? It's like, well... Because they didn't start spending $62,000 the first day they got out of college. Yeah. They spent 25000 which also, by the way, when you're starting from college is, you know, good income. So anyways, and then maybe to stay away from consumer debt. I, I, just, just, I didn't have any good money habits when I was a kid. My parents didn't have any good money habits. I never was exposed to good money habits. So it seemed very necessary to do all the stuff that was you know, like I said, about going fast. So, so that caused some consternation. <laughs> yeah. I think it's all about what you surround yourself with, what, uh, self-talk you have. You know, I w just recently went on this, uh, beach vacation and it was my son and my daughter went with us and they're 23 and, you know, he had a, he had a Jim lore book, which is all about, how to get along with other people, how to maximize your career, how to, I didn't start devouring that stuff soon enough. He also, by the way, listened to spent some time listening to real estate investing podcasts. He was listening to the bigger pockets guys talk on their podcast. And he was listening to this whole thing about multi unit housing at age 23. He's mm -hmm. thinking about how do I become a good real estate investor uh, for me, well, the thing is, though, is that that stuff didn't exist at 23. That's true. For Good you point. and me. Like there wasn't. Well, there, there were, were books. Sure. You know, there, and there rich were, dad, poor dad class. Audio tapes. Know. I went down to some local. There was a local place yeah. that had audio tapes. And I, I, you know, had this service where I'd take out three of them and whatever. Listen to them. But there wasn't drive. like billions of hours of content. That's true. Instantaneously consumable. No. At your fingertips. But and I, so a lot of it was based on. Like you said, to the people that you surrounded yourself with. Yes. I would have told myself to slow down on the cheeseburgers and keep working out more because <laughs> I went through a whole period. I have a funny story about that. I went through a whole period where I thought that, uh, you know, my metabolism was high and it's always going to be high and I didn't have time to work out anymore. So yeah. I quit doing that. And then I, I would say I was pretty close to 40 before I woke up and went, dude, what the hell are you doing? 
<laughs> so when I, when I got my first job, when I worked at American Express, you know, that came with health insurance. And so like being a smart person, I went, well, you should go to the doctor. And so I went to the doctor. I was a uh, Marine reservist at the time. And I, so I do my physical and the doctor says, what do you do for exercise? And I looked at him, I go, exercise this. What needs to be exercised? Shake a look at Doc. this, man. <laughs> I'm like, 175, lean and mean, baby, fighting machine. And he's like, well, you have to do some exercise. And I said, I don't have to do anything. And he said, uh, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> Talking about like things you would have told yourself in your 20s. Yeah. He says, you're going to put on two pounds a year until you're 40. And then you're going to come to me at 220 pounds, overweight, with pre-diabetes and heart problems and go, oh, crap, what do I do? And I went, dude, I'll never weigh 200 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways. <laughs> yeah, keep keep working out is such an important part of your day. And what's there's a new research I, I saw that uh, links how well you think to lifting weights yeah, sure. and the um, endorphins and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. All that. So you make much better decisions when you continually work out. So make that important. Plus for me, dude, you get busier and busier your life and things speed up. You've got, you just get more and more responsibilities. And so keeping this me time where I get to actually plan my day or, you know, not plan my day, whatever I decide to do, that's right. my that's my time. So that's important. You get really philosophical in a while, so we should move move on. I, I have thousands of things that I would I would do differently. Yeah, I just like have, I I want to be a fighter pilot. Like that's what I should have done. I just have like two other brief ones. I like you. I also invested all my time oh, and I energy. Like, I like in, you too. Thanks. Buddy. Thank you. I invested all my time and energy in my business, and I should have stayed diversified. Like I remember having discussions with people, and they were all investing, and I wasn't investing at all. And A, I was surprised that they were all investing and I wasn't. But number two was that my answer to that was, well, I'm investing in my business, which by the mm -hmm. way, turned out well, but very well couldn't have. And I think that was kind of dumb. Well, that was also that again, the culture, you and I are both from the same cloth when it comes to that. I remember doing a, uh, a marketing class where the person who was the leader of the class said, you should incentivize yourself by buying something you can't afford so that you always have to hustle every single month to make sure you get payments. <laughs> and so I'm thinking in my head like, Oh, he means like go out to dinner. No, no. He meant go buy a Porsche because the payments do every 30 days. And you're like, crap, how am I going to come up with a thousand bucks to make this payment? And this guy's managing and, money for other people, helping them make uh, yeah, decisions and, and leading new people. And, and that, Kool-Aid that was being passed around the kitchen of, well, you, you know, you have a micro cap business and so it should generate 15% a year of return. So why would you invest in anything else? Which is the logic that the sales leaders, and this is back before the days of independent firms and all that sort of stuff, when it was all the sales, they wanted you to be fully invested in your business, obviously. They didn't want you to be financially independent. They didn't want you to go, I don't need to bring on any clients this year. I, you know, I make a good income. I've got a whole bunch of money in the bank. Why would I need to do that? They wanted you to be kind of always at the trough, you know, going, oh crap, how am I going to do this? Sure. So I got to feed it more. Knowing the incentives of people around you, I think also is probably important, but, uh, and that's also an important thing. More is not better. More does not equal oh, better. Gosh. Yeah. Well, there's that. That's, yeah. Good that's stuff. podcast number 847. We'll dedicate to yes. more is not better. Thanks uh, for that question, Will. We have a very short one here because I, I almost don't understand the question. And this came to us from Justin. Justin says, with family relatives having Apple devices, which device would have a better value money-wise, the iPad, the iPhone, or the Mac? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why that's coming to us, but here's here, I guess, is my take. If your goal is to be on the same platform with them, like iMessage and iPhoto and be in the same ecosystem, I'd say of the three of them, the iPhone is probably the one that you're going to do most of that work on. So uh, the phone. Um, but generally speaking, using one ecosystem for your devices so they talk to each other makes your life much, much easier. I'll tell you a frustration I have. My son now works for Microsoft and my, uh, all of my devices are Apple now. And 
and I'm thinking about making the switch, but that's a hellacious switch at this point because I'm just completely tied into the whole Apple ecosystem. So mm-hmm. I'd have to rip everything well, it out. It seems like it would be easier just to get your kid to get a job at Apple. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, if, if, if somebody at Apple needs a, needs a good guy on their team, wants to steal them from Microsoft, please talk to me and uh, so that I can have all my devices stay at Apple and get discounts too. Because Lord knows I could use a big fat discount on this Apple stuff because it's slightly expensive. I have no comments on this one. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's about all I got. Not sure about that one. Thanks for the questions, everybody. Got a question for the show? We just uh, cleared a lot of them out of the mailbag. Head to stackingbenjamins.com, and at the top of the page, you'll see questions for the show. Of course, Ramon of everybody today is taking home the shirt because he decided to use the Haven Lifeline. I love it when people write to us and say, hey, I want my shirt. You don't get a shirt for writing into us. You get a shirt if you call the Haven Lifeline. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail to do that. That's going to do it for today. Hey, you know what? If you have uh, more than just a few questions and really you need to look at your entire financial life better, OG's taking clients in, again in 2019 to get on the 2019 list to talk to him. Here's where you go. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. That is the link. Uh, we don't link to it directly from the site. Uh, if you stop by the Stacky Benjamin site, you don't see it there. You need to use the link you hear here, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. That's super duper easy. That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? Well, first, take some advice from today's letter segment. Stay conservative on your expectations from your investments when planning. As mom always says, invest for the best, but plan on the worst and things are going to go your way. Second, converting funds from traditional to Roth plans. Check out tax brackets before making that move and withhold funds ahead of time to pay the tax so you aren't surprised at tax time early next year. But the big lesson? Joe's mom just told me that when it comes to travel, nothing beats the La Quinta hotel chain. I know the history of that chain well. Little known fact, La Quinta is the Spanish term for next to Denny's. See ya! Special thanks to you for sending us your letters. Mom's always happy to hear from you and wanted me to say a kind hello to you and yours. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. The part of Joe's mom's neighbor Doug has been nominated for an Oscar. Welcome to the after show. I was going to talk about the Golden Globes today, but you can do that by yourself some other time. Why? Because all these movies, you've seen a bunch of these movies, I think, but I don't care about this stuff. Why not? Because I kind of sort of detest it. Actually, you detest people having pride in their work and giving out awards for the stuff that's best in class. Not when you put it that way. Like you detest the fact that we've won multiple Plutus awards 
that's horrible. We should tell them, stop doing that. Well, they should have like an upgraded award of some kind. <laughs> In that category only. And we should talk about it all the time, about how great those awards are. I don't want to talk about the Golden Globes. All right. Well, we're not going to. Anyway. I don't watch any of that crap. That's I guess that's what I'm saying is that I find the celebration not inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm walking on eggshells. I f- just f- hate that. I hate the Oscars. I hate the Golden Globes. I hate all those Hollywood parties. I think it's fun as hell. I think it's like the, I, the I know you do most fun okay. stuff ever. Yep, uh, yeah. love yeah. those. Just hammer pencils into my eardrum. Instead, well, you're big on that. I know, and but, eyeballs at the same time. But instead, I'd like to talk about a trip I just took, which was to the Virgin Islands. <laughs> Go back to the Golden Globes. Let's just talk about the Golden Globes. <laughs> We can talk about Bavaria. Would you like to see my 45-minute slideshow on my trip to Bavaria? I have. Thank now, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I will say this. Uh, beach vacations, we rarely take them. And I was so excited to actually take one, which was flipping great to kind of turn your brain off for a week. Uh, mm-hmm. Highly recommend it. I, Basically, you just pretended you were me, like in a normal day. I, I actually finished a book. I actually took a book and I finished it. And it was incredible but love the virgin islands it was there's construction everywhere because two hurricanes one after another just ripped that place up but it was exciting to see it come back to life we took though a day trip i want to talk about this specifically we took a day trip over to the british virgin islands and a lot of people go between these islands because they're all close together and friends of, of ours have actually have rented a catamaran you know, and when we say catamaran, I think about these little things you see in inland lakes. <laughs> no, 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 no. These are these huge things with, you know, sleeping spaces for 15 people or whatever. But, and they'll go from island to island. But there's an island in the British Virgin Islands that has a very famous bar called the Soggy Dollar. And the Soggy Dollar, when people describe the Soggy Dollar to me, I thought it was kind of like the swim up bar at a swimming pool. You know, which I always love, OG. Don't you love it when you can be in a in a bathing suit and you're in the pool and you're drinking your favorite drink while you're still like half submerged? Also sounds like my day to day activities, but go on. <laughs> that, that just that just is super fun. Well, I thought this was that you swim up and then, you know, the bars like on rocks. It's not that at all. It is a secluded beach with this bar on the beach and there's no dock. So these boats get in as close to the shore as possible. And you jump off your boat and you swim into shore. And then that's why they call it the soggy dollar is because, you know, all your money is wet because uh, there's there's no way around it. Our particular vessel was kind of off to one side of the beach. So we <laughs> paddle in. And as I get up to the beach, There's a dude by himself lounging against a palm tree. And I just got there and I'm walking in trying to catch up with my family. And this dude very casually goes, hey, man, need some cocaine? (laughs) And I have to say, I've never had anybody say that to me before. I don't know if you've had that happen to you. And so I I just casually look at him and no, thanks, man. (laughs) I mean, what do you say? You're like, I'm good. Which, which I think is actually exactly what I said. Thank you very much. So I said yes, because <laughs> I've never done cocaine before. And I thought, when in Rome. <laughs> hey, kids, let, let's all learn about this together. This is a no. valuable lesson. You could podcast about it. The supply and demand curve in the, the British Virgin Islands. Island economy, how that works. Mm-hmm. It, was yeah. sur- it, was, it was surreal. Yeah. If you learn... Anything from our podcast, which you shouldn't. But the lesson of the Stacky Benjamin show is don't do coke. <laughs>